Well, good morning. Thank you, Dan and Candice. Uh, it's Chuck Dvorsky with TCEQ in Austin. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, a number of stations, and uh, we're going to take the title literally. We're going to talk about stations from East Texas to West Texas down to the valley. So uh, a waltz across Texas seemed like a, an appropriate topic. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, what we use to monitor, uh, what our goals and objectives are, and uh, the various issues that we've run into uh, with the stations that uh, we're going to visit today. So uh, I'll show you a little bit. This is where we are today. Uh, every dot represents uh, an individual station that's currently active. Um, some of them are operated by TCEQ. Some of them are operated by uh, USGS under uh, um, a joint funding agreement that we have. And uh, we have some that are operated by uh, other entities. Uh, we've got uh, a smattering here and there across the state. We've actually had uh, 105 stations. You say, well, why, why so few dots? Why so few dots? Uh, some of the stations are, were meant to be temporary. We had a project. We had a data need. And we designed a system to go and collect the data for that. And uh, when it was done, we folded the tent and took it elsewhere. And quite honestly, uh, truth be told, some of the stations that we tried just didn't work. And uh, those are gone too. So what we're going to do is we're going to go across Texas and uh, we're going to visit each of these little circles. Uh, from Beaumont in East Texas down to South Texas up to uh, Central Texas out to West Texas and uh, into the Trans-Pecos region as well. Uh, the data uses vary from station to station or project to project. If you look at the, the map, it's pretty easy to see, well, these are kind of sort of clustered. I see this group here and that group there, and another one over here. So. We're going to show a couple of slides of individual stations and talk about those. But uh, for instance, uh, you know, there's seven or eight stations in this group, and there's five in that group, and there's six in that. But uh, too many to visit uh, individually, so we'll talk about them in general. But we'll first talk about how on earth did we get started with this. And uh, it really came down to a legislative mandate. Uh, in June of 2001, uh, our legislature um, had, was paying a lot of attention to uh, problems that were perceived to be caused by uh, CAFOs, dairies basically, in north central Texas. And uh, our first uh, monitoring stations were in the upper north Bosque River and the Leon River, which if you're not from Texas, you say, well, I've never heard of that. Uh, rather small, but they uh, feed into... Uh, into the uh, Brazos River and uh, feed into the water supply for the city of Waco. When we started this, uh, I called it old number one. Uh, we had a solar powered project that had to have uh, a landline phone system, basic uh, SON parameters, temperature, conductivity, PHDO, and uh, using nutrient uh, uh, sensors as well, uh, selective ion uh, probes. Uh, we got the idea we would raise the bar. We could do better than that. And uh, so we added some additional equipment. And at this point, I'm going to stop and say that just because I mention a particular brand or model, please do not take that as an endorsement of that. Uh, we are, we've used half a dozen different companies for uh, sensors, for SONs, for uh, communications, for data loggers, and so forth. So. Uh, we use quite a few, and there are a couple of places where it's kind of sort of, I've got to mention the name, but please don't take that as anything more than this is what we were working with at the time. Uh, the big raising the bar was adding an automated uh, chemistry lab uh, on site out in the field, and uh, we had up to eight of these uh, where a sample was taken and we could analyze for uh, nitrogen species, uh, soluble reactive phosphorus, turbidity, uh, the basic uh, big four parameters, uh, temperature, conductivity, pH, and DO, uh, all of the above, all of the above. But there, 
our issues with with doing that. I mean, we got, we actually got pretty good results over time. It took a little while to to work out the kinks and the quality of this, but uh, we did so, and uh, we found we could even get uh, good data from uh, the ion selective electrodes if we did a calibration and a calibration verification for each measure. Um, at this time, we also started uh, making the data available on, uh, on the Internet, and uh, we got, a, got our own handy-dandy little uh, URL that's just texaswaterdata.org if you would like to see uh, any of our data that's, uh, that's out on the web. Our ingest and display system uh, is called the Leading Environmental Analysis and Display System. It, uh, at the time, it was, it was a proprietary system. It's, it's now owned by uh, Sutron, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what the future of that will be, but uh, they have uh, been creating some uh, particular applications for us and uh, being able to ingest all the, the metadata associated with the auto analyzers was a major task uh, for them, for us, and for the field. And uh, ultimately, we decided we needed to go back and do a secondary simplification uh, because with as, as many of, as eight of these auto analyzers uh, in the field, uh, our regional staff uh, in Stephenville, Texas, was spending one and a half to two full-time equivalents operating, maintaining, servicing, doing routine maintenance uh, on the instruments. And, well, we found that there was a, a really good relationship uh, statistically between total nutrients, and I mean literally the sum of the nitrogen species and the phosphorus species that we were uh, uh, monitoring for and basic specific conductance. Now, with us looking at cathodes and you know discharges uh, from cathodes or uh, inadvertent releases, uh, well, you would, you wouldn't be surprised to see specific conductance uh, actually correlating quite well. So we pulled the plug. We went back to your basic uh, SON technology and. Uh, pretty much continue with that today. We have tried a few other nutrient analyzers. Uh, we've tried some anti-fouling mechanisms, but for the most part, uh, we're SOND-based. We've, uh, we've got a, a fairly large network uh, by comparison, and we have a lot of different participants that are uh, working with us on this. Uh, in TCEQ central office, which is where I am, we have uh, about one and a half FTEs for the entire network. Uh, then scattered out across the state, you know, we've got uh, people who work for TCEQ uh, operating 11 stations in uh, the lower Rio Grande Valley in the Bosque. We have USGS Texas operating uh, 15 stations in the Rio Grande, the Arroyo Colorado, and the Pecos River. Uh, New Mexico USGS does one station just across the border into New Mexico on the Pecos. And uh, fairly recently, we've added a, a project with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife in uh, West Texas. Uh, so a large group that we've worked with, and I've got a list here of you know some of the entities that have been participating with us uh, over time. And some are active, some are not active. Some have accomplished uh, what they were wanting to do with their continuous monitoring. Uh, some are, well, actually, a couple of them um, aren't really showing up on our web pages now because uh, I didn't get an updated QAPP. And uh, without the QAPP, uh, I, I, I don't want to host the data. So uh, we took those off, and we're working to get them uh, get their QAPP uh, back online. Uh, one of the biggest questions that Dan and I hear uh, with the, the sensors work group is, you know, um, what are you doing with this? What do you do with continuous data? Um, continuous data is uh, kind of a different creature. Um, we have made a number of uses for it, and uh, water resource management decisions. We're going to visit these at, as we go to the stations. Uh, interstate surface water allocations between Texas and New Mexico, uh, monitoring uh, for the habitat of endangered species, uh, to develop watershed protection plans, to develop total uh, 
maximum daily loads, uh, simply to monitor baseline conditions in certain areas uh, to support field investigations. Uh, we've used the data for stream segment delineation uh, on the upper Rio Grande. Uh, water quality modeling on the Rio Grande, the Pecos, uh, the Arroyo, Colorado. And uh, yes, we have used it in a limited extent uh, for water quality assessment. Uh, and by that I mean the 305, 305, 305B, 303D uh, process that's required by the Clean Water Act. Um, and that's one, that's the one I think everyone is saying, why can't we do this? Why can't we do this? And I got to say, we want to and we're trying to, but it's really hard to use continuous data for the assessment because basically the assessment techniques that have been developed uh, over the past you know, 30, 40, 50 years have all been based on grab samples. And we're new used to having four, six, or 12 samples a year, and that's what you work with, uh, suddenly having you know, 30,000 plus DO samples at one location is kind of overwhelming. That's a little bit of a little bit of mind-boggling. If you have one site that has continuous data and you've got 30,000 DO samples, and you've got four other sites that have uh, six samples each, well, how do you balance that out? How do you say, well, you know, I I, I can't let the 30,000 drive the whole segment because that's not representative. So we're working on the issue, and um, this comes up frequently at the uh, the sensors work group. Um, one of the other issues is, you know, how do you, how long do you trust the data? I mean, you you deploy a sond and it's there for a month collecting data every 15 minutes, and then after a month you go back and you collect the sond and uh, either you have been transmitting the data or you download the data, and you look at it and you say, man, that looks funny. Uh, what happened here? What happened there? And you know, USGS has you know, some techniques that they use, and now it's uh, in their new Aquarius system, uh, to basically correct for fouling and drift. And not everyone is completely comfortable with correcting the data. Uh, some are, some aren't. But uh, where we're going right now as TCEQ is we're looking at the possibility of simply using the first 24 hours of deployment. Now, if you have a freshly calibrated sond, you take that sond to the field and you deploy it. Unless something catastrophic happens to that sond, you would expect virtually no drift for 24 hours. You would expect virtually no fouling for 24 hours. So how is this different from your basic 24-hour deployment? Well, it's basically because you don't have that CV immediately afterward where you do a calibration verification and say, yep, it was spot on. It was looking good. Um, we're still grappling with that, and uh, we'll continue to do so. I'm uh, going to mention the two photos here. I've got uh, an extreme South Texas on the right. This is uh, a station at the Arroyo, Colorado, which we're going to visit uh, early on. Uh, this is down by uh, Harlingen and Brownsville uh, near the Texas border at, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. The station on the left here is uh, the discharge canal coming out of uh, Balmeray Pool out in the middle of the desert, so in the middle of the Chihuahuan Desert, and uh, we have uh, a series of springs that uh, are producing a, a unique environment out there. We'll visit that one as well, but uh, that one's a little later on. So let's start in East Texas. And the station that we have over there is on Pine Island Bayou. It's a project of one sample, uh, one sampling station that's operated by a, a cooperator of ours called the uh, Lower Natchez Valley Authority. And uh, they and river authorities in general are kind of a, a unique quasi-governmental entity in Texas that uh, in many cases has uh, water quality, water quantity management requirements. So. The folks at uh, LNVA are concerned about the quality of water at this site as it relates to water they deliver for industrial, municipal, and agricultural uses. Uh, photo on the left is uh, a calm day where you know the bayou is, uh, well, you can see it's kind of sort of green, it's rather productive. 
this is a good day, and uh, the photo on the right is uh, post Harvey. And uh, during this event, you know, our station ended up uh, way underwater. Uh, we've had this site flooded several times. This is the worst one. Uh, the uh, bright green oval is actually the canal that uh, water is normally pumped into for distribution. But uh, the folks who are receiving the water need to know the quality of the water in order to treat it for uh, the various uses that they would have uh, uh, in industrial applications. Um, other problems we have at this site is the velocity is very, very low. Uh, basically, definition of a bayou. Um, water doesn't move very fast. Uh, when we service the instruments here, we have a, a problem as well with, uh, because the water is flowing so slowly, when we clean a deployment tube, the debris just kind of hangs around. It doesn't wash past. It continues you know, to be part of the environment that we're attempting to monitor. And since uh, LNVA, the Lower Nature's Valley Authority, is looking at turbidity, uh, well, that, that just really kind of messes up uh, you know, the procedures that we follow in order to measure fouling and drift. Um, we've tried some other methods. Uh, to, to do this, we've tried uh, an instrument that is attached, uh, that the sonde is attached to, that uh, basically lets water in under hydrostatic pressure, uh, allows time for uh, taking a measurement, and then um, evacuates the, the inner container the, uh, where the samples are taken so that uh, your sensors are not exposed to light and they're not left in the water. So the idea was this will you know, provide for a, a longer deployment. Uh, in this particular situation, uh, we had uh, difficulty with the water fluctuating, uh, and we also have a, a very fine um, stratification that occurs here, and uh, we had trouble making sure that we were consistently um, above the, uh, the uh, thermocline and we have decided to forego the, uh, the long deployment module uh, because of uh, just the environment that we're in. It, it's really not effective uh, for, uh, for uh, managing uh, fouling. Uh, the, Lovaca Nava, Nava, ah, the Lower Nature's Valley Authority is, is really pleased with the station. Uh, despite it having been, been flooded, they were you know, dead set, we need to get this site back online. Uh, this is a benefit to uh, large sectors of uh, municipalities, industries, and agriculture in the area. So uh, it's a very, a very useful site, and uh, basically the data on this one is used constantly. Uh, the data at this site is validated, and we're going to draw that distinction here in uh, just a few minutes where we don't validate all the data that we collect. Uh, this data is validated. Uh, it's temperature, pH, DO, conductivity, total dissolved solids, and turbidity. Uh, it's a solar-powered site, as you can see by the uh, by the solar panel. And uh, well, you can't see our little antenna, but uh, we've been uh, very fortunate to use uh, wireless internet protocol uh, for near real-time data for most of our sites. Uh, the wireless internet protocol allows us to receive data, to pull the station, receive data every 15 minutes. Whereas if we go with uh, satellite telemetry with goal, uh, GOES, it's, it's hourly. So uh, it's, it's wonderful when you can do it. Sometimes, as we'll talk about later, it's just not possible. Uh, the next station I wanted to talk about takes us down to uh, southeast Texas, down by the border. And I should have pointed out on the previous slide, if you look at the upper left-hand corner of each slide, you'll see a little map of Texas. And uh, look for that bright dot or dots, and uh, that'll show you where we are. So uh, on the previous one, here I'm going to pop it back. Uh, you can see that uh, we were over in east Texas, uh, right next to uh, Louisiana. 
here we are down in South Texas, right next door to, to Mexico. Uh, this project is on uh, the Arroyo Colorado, which means uh, basically the red arroyo. And we've been working for years and years and years as TCEQ and as local cooperators to develop watershed protection plans for parameters in that area. Uh, the data that we collect here is kind of unique right now for our for the stations that we're using because we have uh, an automated profiler uh, at this location. We have that profiler for a number of reasons. We've, we've tried to monitor the site uh, twice before and had absolutely no luck. Uh, the top uh, you know, layer of water the, above the uh, 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 halo cline here is extremely productive. Uh, the photo on the right there shows you what happens with two weeks in the productive zone. And, uh, well, that's fine for the top, but uh, at the bottom it's uh, anoxic. Uh, lots of hydrogen sulfide, and basically we can eat a sand in a week or so and you know, need to replace absolutely everything. Uh, USGS operates this site for us, and uh, um, they, um, uh, Petri developed a wonderful tool for anyone who has to deal with a thing like this. Uh, uh, in order to clean out that uh, deployment tube, uh, it took a half-inch drive uh, cordless electric screwdriver and put uh, the... Uh, the filaments that you use for a weed eater on it and just buzzes that thing down and it throws shells and debris, you know, 10 feet. You never want to be near this. Uh, what we've managed to achieve with this station is, you know, we've identified uh, when the critical periods occur uh, for the sake of the uh, watershed protection plan. And they know that, uh, they know now that their focus needs to be specifically on the months of July and August, which is when, uh, the dissolved oxygen really crashes, and we have uh, have uh, major issues there. Uh, we've also uh, developed uh, the data for uh, validating uh, water quality models of, the, of DO in the area. Uh, we're hoping to uh, do some more model runs in the near future. Uh, the uh, other thing about this, you, you notice that there's a, uh, a set of pylons here and bumpers uh, this is an active barge lane, and uh, we have barges that are you know, 200 feet long uh, going through here routinely, as well as uh, passenger boats, uh, private boats. And uh, the bridge that you see above is a historic vertical lift drawbridge, last one in Texas. Uh, in order to go to this site, we have to coordinate with the uh, with TxDOT, the Texas Department of Transportation, to make sure that uh, there's not a barge coming. Uh, to know when they're going to be lifting the bridge. Uh, basically, you know, it, it, it can be a, a very dangerous situation. Um, when you are there and a barge goes past, uh, you're going to be washed ashore. We're going to stay in South Texas uh, for the next site uh, or sites. This is a, a series of uh, six stations that we have on the lower Rio Grande uh, running from... Uh, from near Harlingen, Texas, up to Roma, Texas. And uh, you take my word for it, there's that one dot, but uh, they're very close together. Um, the project uh, was put together really because of uh, the impact that uh, we were seeing on water quality in the Rio Grande from uh, agricultural return flows from Mexico. Uh, the particular culprit was uh, a structure called the El Morillo Drain, it's actually the drain overflow that uh, could jack the uh, the uh, TDS from a background of 800 to you know suddenly it's at uh, 1800 uh, parts per million milligrams per liter of uh, dissolved solids, and uh, we have a lot of agriculture here. This is our, our primary focus is making sure that uh, we know what the water quality is like before uh, the canal uh, companies, you know, divert the water into a field of a sensitive plant that, uh, you know, basically is going to uh, die because of the, uh, of the uh, solids content in the water. Um, 
we have used this, these systems, uh, the, the stations in this area, uh, to, you know, request, I'm going to say, water from uh, Mexico's water right to dilute the water in the Rio Grande uh, because, you know, their discharge from the Elmo Rio drain has uh, driven the water quality down so low that it's damaging to crops. So uh, it's it's claimed that, you know, we uh, got 75,000 acre feet of water from Mexico in order to freshen the river. Uh, I'm not in that arena. I can't really verify that. That's, uh, uh, well, we'll, we'll say it's uh, reasonably assumed. Uh, these stations are, are really simple. I mean, for what we're doing here, we don't do a full set of parameters. We're using uh, temperature and conductivity uh, from that, of course, you get specific conductance, and from that, using the, I'm going to put in quotes, universal conversion factor, uh, you multiply the conductivity times 0.65, and it gives you an estimate of total dissolved solids. You know, the actual conversion factor varies from place to place to place, but uh, globally, 0.65 seems to work just beautifully. Uh, the system that we have here is a little different from the previous ones. We do get our data wirelessly every 15 minutes, but when the data is received uh, at our database in Austin, basically it's sniffed as it comes in, and we send out notifications when the conductivity and TDS suggest that uh, dissolved solids are greater than 1,000 parts per million, which is kind of a threshold for uh, damage to certain crops, uh, particularly uh, I would say uh, let's look at uh, crops like sugarcane, which is really big down there. Uh, and when it is young, it is very, very sensitive to uh, dissolved solids. Whole research sector down there that is working on you know, resistant strains of, uh, of sugarcane. Uh, at the other end of, of this project, we have uh, a station at the city of Roma's water supply. Um, Again, we're looking at the Rio Grande. Uh, the water quality is uh, much different here. Uh, this water is being released from uh, Falcone Reservoir uh, upstream on the Rio Grande. And uh, water generally is running uh, with uh, dissolved solids of uh, six to 700, sometimes a little bit higher. But uh, again, we, we do notifications on, uh, on the fly. So, these are stations that we do not validate the data, never validate the data. Uh, what we are doing is we are using the data as soon as we get it to send out notifications uh, that the water quality might be you know, damaging to crops. Uh, if we waited for our monthly service interval and did our, uh, our, our measurements of fouling and drift and so forth and went in and validated the data, well, a month or so after the water went by, then we can say, oh, uh, that water probably wasn't good for irrigating sugar cane. So we don't validate the data. We're not, uh, we don't have um, a TDS uh, listing for this area. Um, it is simply TDS, you know, looking at uh, the use of the water for irrigation and the treatability of the water uh, for uh, potable supply for uh, the city of Roma and others. Another place where we don't validate the data is back where we began uh, with uh, TCEQ's continuous monitoring. This is in what we call the North Bosque Environmental Monitoring and Response Project, or actually Response System. So we have an acronym, EMERS. And uh, this is where we started out with a SOND and then we added the trailer with the uh, auto analyzer uh, monitoring uh, nutrients as well as turbidity as well as the, the basic four parameters. And uh, required, you know, we had to have the trailer, we had to have the gates, we had to have air conditioning and heating, we had to have hardwired power, and we had to have a pump down in the, in the creek, and we had to have the sun down in the creek. So we need to be able to deliver that sample you know, up to the station. And I'm sure you notice in that middle picture that 
the, that there's no water. There's no water, which is common in this area. Uh, the streams are ephemeral, and uh, they flow when they flow, and they don't when they don't. And uh, we originally put some of our stations on the main stem of the Bosque and the Leon River. You may remember that from uh, like the third slide in the presentation. But when we were looking at the river, uh, we couldn't parse out anything. Uh, there was just too much water. So what we're looking at is events. And, you know, we're monitoring for an event. We uh, went to uh, what I'm calling a kinder, simpler sensing, which is uh, back to uh, temperature, conductivity, and depth. Uh, with that, uh, we send notifications to our our field staff at uh, the Stephenville office, which is uh, um, you know, a field office uh, that is specifically uh, located because of uh, the high concentration of uh, animal feeding operations and, and dairies in the area. So uh, this is one of our older stations where we still have the, uh, the trailer and so forth there and the pumps. Um, newer stations look more like this. Uh, this is one on Indian Creek, also near Stephenville. And this is our, our basic design. Uh, we've got a uh, data, collection, uh, data collection platform that's basically composed of a utility pole with uh, a traffic control box, uh, instruments inside, solar panel on top. And in this case, you see the antenna for the internet protocol um, modem sticking way, way, way up high and directional. Um, Self-service is not great in this area. And uh, sometimes we, we struggle with that uh, in order to maintain communication and to be able to have timely data. Um, again, you see on the, on the right that uh, there's not always a whole lot of water here. We're looking for an event. And uh, we've, we've caught a number of events. There have been uh, notifications of violation. We've had uh, enforcement against uh, a number of entities out here uh, in this area. The, uh, the problem still is that, um, well, staff resources, even though we don't have the, uh, the auto analyzer in, in, in uh, the works anymore, it still takes a lot to maintain these stations, particularly when we're dealing with uh, mice. Mice have been uh, a plague in this area, more than floods, uh, more than drought, but mice. Uh, mice love to get inside of a, uh, a conduit where it's safe from predators, and you now they get bored and they just nibble on anything like our cables. So uh, we're working to uh, basically seal these things up to where you know, you have the sensor sticking out of the end of the pipe on the right, just beyond that lime green, and uh, we have it sealed all the way up into uh, the traffic box that you see on the left. Um, another problem we have with these uh, streams is, depending on the amount of rain, dilution factors can be radical, radically different. Um, a small flow, uh, probably going to look okay unless there's a discharge, uh, an illicit discharge to the system. Uh, same illicit discharge at a higher flow, you're not even going to see it. So uh, we have to interpret what we're seeing. And sometimes simply the, the notifications that we send to, uh, to help the region and the field office prioritize their, uh, their field activities isn't enough. It requires, you know, the individual, you know, who has experience to interpret the data. This is what our, what our valid, our, uh, our notifications look like. So, you know, when the system, you know, detects uh, a, a value above uh, an individual uh, threshold, and each of the four stations we have in that area uh, has uh, an individual threshold that uh, we're looking for. And when that's exceeded, you know, bang, you know, within, uh, I'll say within 30 minutes of the time the, the sample is taken, a notification is sent to our regional office so uh, they can look at it and determine what action to take uh, to go to the field and where to go to the field um, in order to uh, try to make their, uh, their time, you know, most effective. Those were water quality, and uh, this is kind of a, a strange one here. 
Uh, well, I'm not going to say strange. It's really it's working very well now. But uh, we were called to uh, monitor discharge on a very regular basis uh, due to uh, water rights issues in uh, the San Saba River, which is to uh, the north and west of Austin. Uh, you can see we built a tower because the flood of record would uh, basically take that uh, up about 10 feet. Uh, the canal itself is uh, about 150 years old. Um, you might suspect that it has been well maintained, but it hasn't. Uh, it's degraded, it's gotten broad, it's gotten shallow, it's gotten obstructed. Uh, what you're looking at in the picture on the right is uh, the old control structure, which uh, because of the flood events that we prepared for in the photo on the left, uh, it's falling away. Uh, we're looking at potentially uh, relocating the station. Uh, it was a very good place for us to monitor at the time, but uh, as it continues to degrade, uh, we're looking at alternatives. The uh, water right holder uh, you know, has access to this canal, and it's about 15 miles long. Uh, the first five miles of it is in unconsolidated alluvium and leaks like the proverbial sieve. 50% um, of the water that is diverted from the San Saba River uh, returns to the alluvium within the first five miles. So as with uh, the previous two st uh, sets of stations, uh, we have this set up uh, with a, a mechanism to send notifications uh, when the water right is at 50% of its annual, 75% uh, of its annual amount, 90% uh, and 100 plus. Uh, we also have a criteria that it's not supposed to exceed 30 cubic feet per second. So we have a set of uh, notifications that go out on that as well. Um, the most interesting thing at this slide is uh, right down in the bottom left-hand corner of the photo of the going, going, uh, there's a beautiful four-foot coral snake, freshly shed, absolutely beautiful, and he got away. But uh, the predominant species in here tends to be uh, the uh, cottonmouth water moccasin, uh, really ugly uh, venomous snake, so uh, we watch our step in this area. Uh, the station is uh, using uh, an ADCP to monitor uh, the depth, water temperature, uh, and uh, using uh, Doppler to uh, measure the velocity in multiple cells uh, across the channel. Uh, you can also see that there's a second line coming down. Uh, the, the ADCP is uh, the one that's uh, further up in the photo. We have uh, a standard uh, USGS bubbler at uh, this location as well for, uh, for gauge height. And uh, the results we're finding um, in uh, doing uh, field measurements is the ADCP and uh, the cross-section um, flow measurements that are being made by USGS are very, very tight. Uh, we're getting some very good data here. Uh, the pressure transducer on the ADCP and the bubbler tend to be within a hundredth of a foot uh, in, uh, in uh, water level. So uh, we're getting uh, very good results there. And now we're out in West Texas where, well, sometimes there's water and sometimes there's not. Uh, this is what the Pecos River looks at like uh, out near New Mexico and uh, near Pecos, Texas. Uh, honestly, it, it's kind of a sad looking stream. Uh, the conductivities are way high. Uh, a lot of this is naturally occurring, uh, just based on the fact that we're out in the Chihuahuan Desert and uh, the water, uh, the groundwater that's coming in, is already salty. Uh, the trees that you see in the, the brush line here are pretty much dead tamarisk uh, or salt cedar, uh, an invasive species that uh, manages to uh, concentrate the salt in the water uh, various ways. First, it you know, is a, a major uh, water user. It's very thirsty. And uh, then it exudes salt through its uh, leaves and then drops the leaves. So that gets back in as well. So uh, in the upper upper stretches, you know, we've been uh, working with uh, 
Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board, and uh, you know a, uh, a a collective cooperative group uh, trying to address these issues. And, you know what we've done is uh, we've done selective spraying of the uh, salt cedar, but uh, we have not removed uh, the salt cedar. Uh, so the debris is there, and uh, when these things go, uh, the streams go up, when it rains, we have floods. So despite being uh, in the Chihuahuan Desert with you know, low water levels being expected, uh, flood threats are real. And uh, we have lost more of our monitoring stations to, um, to flood waters in the West Texas region than we have in you know, the areas on the coast where we have hurricanes. Uh, when floods come, they are ugly. Upper Pecos looks like this, but when you get down close to the Rio Grande, the Pecos River is a thing of beauty. Uh, we're monitoring at this site, and you can see a, a variety of tubes. This is an International Boundary and Water Commission uh, uh, weir. But uh, our interest here is what is the uh, TDS loading to uh, Amistad Reservoir, an international reservoir that's uh, about 15 miles downstream from here. Uh, this station, you can guess, had uh, some major obstacles to uh, getting it installed. The uh, bluff or the, the canyon wall is about 90 feet, and uh, you had, they had to uh, cut their way down. IBWC, not us. Uh, we never could have afforded it. Uh, it's a fantastic site. Uh, if you have a chance to be out on the uh, Pecos River, it's it's a beautiful river. As you get downstream, it doesn't all look like it does up in New Mexico. Moving to the Rio Grande, we have uh, a variety of issues. Again, you know, low water conditions are quite common, and high water conditions come frequently. This is the mighty Rio Grande. And, uh, there are places like uh, just here in mid-picture where you can step across the Rio Grande. Uh, when the water comes up, these banks fill with uh, water, and uh, then when the water drops, the sandy banks cave in too. So uh, we bury the station routinely and have to dig it out. Uh, USGS operates this one as well, and we're trying to come up with a new design slightly downstream from here to where we can... Uh, will be able to uh, hopefully keep the, the station operational. Uh, this station and uh, the other four in this set used for uh, a lot of different uh, purposes. We've got, uh, we've been using the data to uh, monitor the reintroduction of uh, the Rio Grande silvery minnow, which is uh, an endangered species. Uh, we've used uh, the data to delineate stream segments uh, that we use uh, in our uh, assessment. Uh, monitoring to uh, develop relationships and modeling uh, to uh, on uh, for temperature and dissolved oxygen, looking at uh, predicting fish kills, and uh, looking at species diversity based on uh, statistical models of, uh, of discharge. Um, going to move a little further. I see I'm running short on time. This is what the Rio Grande is supposed to look like. Uh, this is about 60 miles from that previous station. This is Santa Elena Canyon, and our monitoring station uh, that you have on the right here is also designed for uh, high flows. Uh, this stretch has had flows that uh, were measured up to 80,000 CFS. Uh, when the floods come that big, it's generally not from rain. It's from releases from uh, reservoirs in Mexico where they were afraid the dam was going to, uh, to burst. Uh, sedimentation is a real issue here because of the the nature of the of the storms that we get. We actually have monsoon season out here, and the monsoon will drop up you know three inches of water in one canyon, and that comes rushing down and carries all the debris that's been there for a year or two. And the next one will be in a different canyon a week or so later. Uh, we've had. Uh, our GS uh, operator, you know, go out to service the site because it had sedimented in, and not even get back to uh, their home base, which is in uh, San Angelo, have to turn around and go back. You know, to do you know this loop of five stations, uh, it's it's right at an 800 mile round trip. The Pecos trip uh, for all the stations on the Pecos is 700 miles, uh, and it's way out in West Texas, so. 
we, TCEQ, don't have the staff to do it, and uh, GS has uh, the experience in A, construction, and B, operation, and C, uh, data validation. So uh, it's a natural relationship that we work with them. And now for an unusual one. This is in the middle of the Chihuahuan Desert, and the little arrow is pointing to a swimming pool, Balmeray State Park, and uh, Cinegas, or Cinegas, which are uh, basically uh, desert marshes, if you can believe such a thing exists. Uh, we have uh, water starting and uh, groundwater 400 miles uh, to the north of here and as little as 30 miles to the south of here that uh, drive water quality uh, in this uh, water body. The water body is, as I said, it's a, a, it was a Cinega. Uh, desert marsh, but during the Great Depression, the Citizens Conservation Corps built the Balmeray Pool. And it's uh, kind of an Art Deco swimming pool, uh, uh, about one and a half acres, uh, crystal clear water, right at 70 degrees, and home to multiple endangered species that had developed uh, living in these uh, the waters in the Senegas. Uh, able to deal with the high conductivity. So conductivity is running routinely 33, 3400 microsiemens. And uh, we have a phantom spring snail, we have a phantom tyronia, a pecos gambusia, uh, Comanche springs pupfish that are all in this, in this uh, system. Now the original saltwater marsh, the desert marsh, was effectively destroyed by this project. But Parks and Wildlife, uh, working with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, developed uh, a plan and created uh, artificial cinegas and are maintaining populations uh, of the organisms. Parks and Wildlife asked us to work with them in a cooperative effort uh, to monitor the conductivity and you know, therefore the TDS in this area because of uh, the potential for contamination of the groundwater uh, by oil and gas exploration, uh, particularly to the uh, to the north in the Apache Mountains, uh, but to some extent as well to the south in the Davis Mountains. Uh, our station is really very straightforward. Uh, we're here with USGS, who is uh, monitoring discharge, and we're monitoring uh, conductivity and uh, temperature and depth. Uh, when the Water quality changes here in the future, if it does. Um, 400 miles of aquifer potentially is, is you know, contaminated, degraded, uh, has increasing uh, conductivity, and you know, particularly the, uh, the gastropods are going to have difficulty with that. So with this monitoring, we will be able to, uh, we in Parks and Wildlife will be able to try to uh, mitigate and maintain populations of these endangered species. Um, it's interesting that uh, the water, um, the spring discharges vary. Uh, the waters coming from the Apache Mountains to the north are pretty much constant uh, conductivity and are not affected by rainfall events. The waters to the south coming into the Davis Mountains, uh, the volume does increase markedly uh, with rainfall and the uh, conductivity T and TDS drop. So you have uh, interesting shifts in water quality based on where the water is coming from. And I'm hoping some of you have been wondering, you know, God, that's such a cool picture. Where is that picture, that beautiful little whirlpool? This is called Antioch Cave Whirlpool. And uh, this is in Onion Creek, uh, just outside of Austin. And uh, it's beautiful, and uh, it feeds the Edwards Aquifer, which is a uh, water supply for rural and uh, urban populations, uh, a number of endangered species as well. Uh, it's had a checkered past because uh, in the 90s, uh, actually, someone got too close to the whirlpool, and uh, they weren't recovered for a couple of days. So. We wanted to work with the Barton Springs Edwards Aquifer Conservation District to really to manage the quality of water going into this aquifer. Uh, water going into this cave and caves in the area uh, 
travel as much as 18 miles in two days as groundwater and uh, enter uh, a swimming pool that we have in Austin called Barton Springs, uh, 18 miles away. Uh, in the past, every time there would be uh, a storm event, uh, once it had cleared, once the water had gone down, uh, the district would have to go and manually dig out everything from Coke bottles and beer cans and dead possums and branches, uh, all of which uh, are visible as opposed to any herbicides, pesticides, uh, nutrients that would be going into the aquifer. So uh, we designed a system using 319 funds and uh, built this vault, which uh, measures a uh, basic set of parameters uh, plus turbidity and uh, water level. And uh, based on you know a system that we put together with uh, Barton Springs Edwards Aquifer, uh, as the water rises and the turbidity increases, uh, we use uh, pressured air valves to close the entrance to the cave. And when the turbidity drops, uh, we open the entrance to the cave and ensure that only the water that is of good quality is going into the uh, into the aquifer. So uh, this is. It's effectively a SCADA system where the instruments monitor and the instruments take action. Uh, you see that we have uh, the, the structure here, we have uh, the inlet for monitoring here, and we have the intake pipe to the cave on the downstream side of the concrete, and we have mesh to keep uh, various and sundry debris out. The control mechanisms are up on the bank a little bit higher up. But uh, this is, I think, a, a fantastic use of uh, continuous water quality monitoring. So that's really it. I've got five minutes left. I'm sorry to have run so long, but uh, I hope we can uh, have time for a few questions. Uh, you have my contact information at the bottom of uh, the slide here. And um, bottom line is, you know, continuous water quality monitoring can be put to any number of uses. You need to look at you know, what are your data needs and say, I can or I can't collect this data. I will or will not be able to use it. And bear in mind that it's always possible that uh, your station's going to fail to do what you need it to. And you have to regroup or just fold the tent and go away. <laughs>